Hi, this is Christopher Schwarz, one of the authors of The Joiner and Cabinet Maker, and this is the audio slideshow for The Packing Box. The Packing Box is the first project featured in the book, and while a lot of us might think that it is a little too simplistic for our woodworking skills, I would urge you to give it a try. It really lays a lot of the foundation skills of handwork that will become useful as you build the other two projects in the book. So let's get started. Thomas began his project by looking over his wood in the wood room with the master. Thomas was looking at sawing deals, and deals are nine inch wide pieces of softwood. Now they don't sell deal at Lowe's or Home Depot, so I had to find wood that was in the rough that closely matched what Thomas worked with. And here I am marking out in the rough some of my cuts. Now there are two real tricks to using hand saws. One is to have a sharp saw. The other is to have a saw bench. And this is a workshop appliance that is about as high as your knee and it has a wide flat top. You need two of them for most of the work. Here you can see the saw benches in action. Well, you can see one, the other one's off camera and uh, how I use my legs to secure the work down. One knee presses down on the saw bench and the other secures the edge. Now when you cut with hand saws, one of the tricks is to start with your saw pitched really low. This makes it easier for the saw to enter the cut. It also gives you a nice long kerf so that your cut will be more accurate. Once your kerf is established, you can move the saw up into the working angle, which is 45 degrees for cross-cut saws. For rip saws, it's about 60 degrees to the face of the board. Once you get the wood sawn out, I recommend you sticker it when you're not working with it. Pine has a tendency to cup, twist, wind, bow, whatever it can do. And so by putting it on stickers, you'll reduce the tendency for it to warp when you're not working with it. Here's a nice artistic shot of the stickers. I love playing with depth of field. All the projects in this book require basically three bench planes. On the top, we have what's called a triplane. Some people call it a joiner plane. To the right, the shorter plane is what is called a smoothing plane. And on the bench is what is called a jack plane. Now in this project, almost all the work is done with a jack plane though some of the work is also handled by the smoothing plane. The triplane comes into play during the second project in the book, which is called the school box. The trick to using any wedged plane is to understand the wedge. The wedge is tapped after every adjustment, so if you increase the depth of cut, you then tap the wedge before you go to work. Decrease the cut, tap the wedge. Change the lateral, tap the wedge, and on and on and on. Here I am dressing one of the long rough edges of one of the boards with my jack plane. Now note the position of my left hand. This is critical. My thumb is over the toe of the plane, right in front of the mouth, while my fingers trail behind on the sole against the face of the work. This keeps the plane true. The other important thing about the jack plane is that it is used for taking really thick shavings. If you're using your jack plane in general to take gossamer shavings, you probably got it set wrong. Once you get one long edge straight and true, you need to make the other long edge parallel to it. And for that, you use a panel gauge. Panel gauge looks like an oversized marking gauge and that's because that's what it basically is. It has a bigger head and a longer beam. Now this one has a pencil. Some panel gauges will have a pin or a knife like a traditional marking gauge. You simply run the head against the true edge and it marks a parallel line to your finished width. Then work down to that line and you're done. Now, to make sure that your edges are tried and true, you basically need two tools. One of them is a long wooden straight edge. And here I am putting the straight edge on my edge and I'm looking for light between the straight edge and the work. If I can see light, then I know exactly what areas I need to remedy to get that edge true. 
try part of tried and true, and I'm using a try square to see if the edge is perpendicular to the face of the board. Usually I'll check it in two or three spots on a board that of this length. Longer boards, I'll check it in more areas. Shorter boards, fewer areas. This was a really unfamiliar procedure outlined in the joiner and cabinet maker. To make the ends square, Thomas simply marked them with a knife and then worked down to that knife line with a smoothing plane. I was a little skeptical because I use a shooting board all the time, but uh, it worked really well. With the ends of the end pieces square, the next step is to deal with the front and the back of the packing box. Now, do you square the ends of the front and back? No, what you actually do is you just establish square pencil lines where the ends will be nailed. Now, the front and back will overlap the ends when you're done, but you'll just trim them back with a plane. You're gonna see how that works here in just a minute. Here I am boring the pilot holes for the uh, cut nails that are going to join the front to one of the ends. Um, notice how that front overlaps the end. And here are the cut nails in action. Notice that the wedging action of the cut nail bites into the end grain. If you turn the nail so that the wedge is applied against the long grain, you're likely to split the work. Here I am nailing what I think is the back onto one of the ends. Note that I'm working against the bench, which uh, makes for a firm nailing surface. Now who says nails and dovetails can't play well together? Here I am nailing the nails in a dovetail shape, and that helps to wedge one of the fronts or backs against the edge. It's a very traditional technique, not something I made up. More nailing, this one in a more romantic setting. Uh, notice I'm not wearing my hearing protection. It's there in my shop apron. I'm probably also not wearing heavy duty goggles. I'm probably also not wearing a cup. So I guess OSHA is going to be coming after me after they see this video. And ah, the bucolic shop shot at the end of the day. Um, we love taking these shots and what they say is, don't you wish you had my job, which Sorry about that, but yeah, I'm glad I have my job. Okay, now the case is together so we can deal with the bottom and the top. Now each bottom and top is composed of two boards that are held together with cross strengtheners, what some people might call battens. So the first step is to true the edges so that the two pieces of the bottom and the two pieces of the top meet together airtight. Here's a traditional way to see if you have two edges that mate. Place one edge on top of the other and rotate them with your fingers at the seam. If the top board spins freely on the bottom board, you have a hump or a bump on one or both of the edges that needs to be removed. If the edges drag at the corners when you wiggle them, that usually means that the edges are flat and are mating, or you might have a slight hollow. And a hollow is certainly better than a bump. Here I am preparing the cross strengtheners that will attach the pieces on the bottom and the top. You can lay out this chamfer and plane down to it, or you can just simply do it freehand with your eyeball. So how do you keep these two top pieces or two bottom pieces together while you nail the cross strengtheners on them? Uh, you might not have some sort of vice setup that'll allow you to do that. Now the old school way is the blasphemy way, which is to nail into your bench top and wedge the pieces up together and then nail the cross strengtheners on them. Blasphemy. Somewhere out there, somebody with a furniture grade workbench is surely sobbing a little bit when I do this. I'm driving some nails into my workbench top to hold the two pieces to the bottom together. This is a totally traditional technique, as evidenced by the fact that I've seen hundreds, maybe thousands of nail holes on benches. 
And here I am using the totally period inappropriate egg beater drill to drill my pilot holes. Now the pilot holes are going almost all the way through the bottom piece below the cross strengtheners and I'm driving my nails almost all the way through because I don't want them to go into the workbench. And so I'm tapping them all to about the same consistent depth. And then the next thing I'll do is I will raise the entire assembly up on some scraps and drive the nails all the way through the bottom board so that I can clinch them. When I flip the bottom board over, this is what the nails look like when they are ready for clinching. Uh, there are lots of ways to clench a nail. Uh, one of them is to put a piece of steel or an anvil or maybe another hammerhead underneath these nail heads while you beat the tip. And that's essentially what I'm going to do here. Here I am about to strike the first nail tip. After the first strike, the nail tip starts to bend. My second strike kind of stunk, which means I didn't get it all the way into the wood, which is what I'd prefer. My third strike got it down to the wood. Note that I'm going across the grain with the nail. This increases the holding power of the clenching. And after the third or fourth strike, you should have the nail completely sunk into the wood and maybe even a little French mark like I left there. Now, if you're a total candy bottom wuss girl, you can do this sort of manual clenching trick, which is to take a pair of needle nose pliers and start bending over the tip this way. You can try this a couple times until you build confidence that clenching works. Uh, but I urge you to pick up some speed by just trying it against a steel plate. It's really not hard. Here I am laying down a bead of glue all along the bottom edge of the packing box. Now normally in cabinet construction, this would be considered the uh, bozo no-no of the wood movement world uh, because you would have the bottom in opposition to the ends of this case. But this is just a simple packing box, sort of a U-Haul box made out of wood. So we're not gonna get all worked up about wood movement. But we are going to get jolly with the nails. I'm sure that the Tremont Nail Company loves to see photos like this. Lots and lots of nails are what keeps the packing box together. Notice how the bottom overhangs the uh, case a little bit. We're going to trim all of these proud edges with a smoothing plane. Here I'm preparing the top of the packing box and I'm clenching the top piece on an old table saw wing, which is a real fast way to get the job done. I like to take off as much of the overhang as possible with a jack plane because it removes wood in a hurry. And then when I get close, I switch to a smoothing plane. Here I have the packing box uh, supported by a platform. It's a piece of scrap wood that is secured to my bench top and then I've secured the packing box in my leg vise. This is a good way to work on cabinets and carcass sides so you don't have to have the whole assembly up on top of your bench and yourself on a stool. And then with the top and bottom trimmed to size, I can then bevel off the ends of the cross strengtheners as shown here. And here we are with the finished project ready for the customer. The top is ready to go on. There's an envelope of nails, a spare hammer to do the job. Now, even if you think this project is beneath you, I encourage you to give it a try. Remember, Thomas built this in five hours, so you can set yourself a time moment, make it sort of a challenge. There are a lot of basic handwork skills wrapped up into the packing box. Things that are going to carry you into the second project of the book, which is the school box.